Good morning. My name is Catherine Sipper, and I'm a member of Hernando Church of the Nazarene. For the past several weeks, we've been discovering the ways that God's laws or the Ten Commandments are given for our benefit. We learned that it's not just rules. God's law reveals to us who God is. We've been talking about several interesting perspectives on who God is and the ways that God reveals himself through his laws. Today, we are going to finish up with the Ten Commandments and talk about God's laws concerning our relationship with others. Uh, during the course of the lesson this morning, I'll be speaking from three different Bible versions, the New King James Version in some cases, the New International Version, and the Message. So what I would suggest to you is to have a pen and paper close by, write down the scriptures, and then look them up in the Bible version that you're most comfortable with. Okay, let's get started. Uh, the best way to sum things up is by reflecting on Jesus' summary of the Ten Commandments uh, as described in Matthew 12, 28, and the verses that follow. And these are from the New International Version. Verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, and this is the verse that pertains to what we'll be talking about today. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Um, this morning, we'll start with some points about commandment number nine, and then we'll follow that with important observations about commandment number 10. Commandment number nine brings to light the point about the importance Yes, even the sacredness of our word. And by that, I mean what we say, what we promise, uh, sharing unverified information about another person, whatever we say. And the Bible says in Exodus 20, 16 from the NIV, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And in the message, it reads, no lies about your neighbor. The importance here is to be as good as your word. And here's some things to think about. Number one, the words that come out of our mouths are a direct reflection of the integrity in our hearts. Two, we are to develop a greater awareness and watchfulness over the truthfulness of our speech and our intentions. Number three, we are to develop a deeper understanding of the importance of truthfulness and integrity. integrity sorry. And above all, we need to pursue these things and practice them. And what does God's word say about the last commandment, the 10th commandment? It's an important key to being content. Remember that. In Exodus 20, 17, it reads from the New International Version, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And in the message it says, no lusting after your neighbor's house or wife or servant or maid or ox or donkey. Don't set your heart on anything that is your neighbor's. Okay, what are we to remember about this final commandment? Remember these. One, a lifestyle of contentment counteracts an unhealthy desire for more. Two, we are to experience the contentment that comes from loving God, not things. And the unswerving assurance, we need to remember this, God will provide. We can experience contentment that comes from loving God and not things. In other words, pursue peace. Now, let's back up a little and go deeper into the importance of being as good as our word. And we're referencing commandment number nine. 
in Zechariah 8, 16 through 17, it says, and this is from the New International Version, these are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other and render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other and do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, says the Lord. And the message says, and I like the way it says this, and now here's what I want you to do. Tell the truth, the whole truth when you speak. Do the right thing by one another, both personally and in your courts. Don't cook up plans to take unfair advantage of others. Don't do or say what isn't so. I hate all that stuff. Keep your lives simple and honest. Okay, and again to follow up with the final verse in this section, in Matthew 5, 33 through 37, we read, and this is from the message, and don't say anything you don't mean. This counsel is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smoke screen, sorry, of pious talk saying, I'll pray for you and never doing it or saying, God be with you and not meaning it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace and making your speech sound more religious. It becomes less true. Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong. I did some additional study on my own as I thought about these two commandments. How does Jesus want us to live and govern our speech. These scriptures in particular came to mind. First, Proverbs 18.21, and I'll read from the New King James Version and then the message. It reads, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat their fruit. And the message, it says, words kill, words give life. They either poison or fruit. You choose. Okay, and the thing to bear in mind with these particular scriptures is to remember the time that people were under a king. And the king had the power and authority through his speech to command life or sparing that life. So if the king said death, you were killed. If he said let him go, then you were allowed to go free. And so, again, as I've mentioned before, we're taking a physical application and making a spiritual one. Once you say something, you can never take it back. You have the ability, by speaking positive, to bring life and encouragement. Whereas you can harm someone by speaking untruth, not keeping your promise, spreading untruths about someone, you can destroy their character and destroy any interest in them pursuing a godly life because you become that example. Now, all of these scriptures let us know the importance of speaking truth. False testimony can kill a reputation, as I mentioned, destroy or damage relationships, and there is harm spiritually. Truth speaking is essential for establishing and preserving peace the health and overall well-being of a stable society. God loves the truth and despises the deception, injustice, and violence that undermine the basis of mutual trust. Dishonesty threatens the survival of civic law and order. So, in our spiritual walk, we are to strive for a higher standard. A promise is a promise regardless of the formulation of the oath. Those looking for loopholes, excusing dishonesty, miss the point. Jesus' point was that his followers should be so transparently honest that their promises could be trusted without the formality of an oath. The title of today's lesson puts it well, Christians are to be as good as our word. An old-fashioned saying described an honest, trustworthy, reliable person, his word is his bond or she's a woman of her word. When we look back to Adam and Eve, we find out that the first sin involved the dishonest speech of the evil one, which elicited dishonest speech 
from Adam and Eve. A lie beget a lie beget a lie beget a lie. Humankind continues to engage in dishonest speech out of fear, a perceived need to deflect or defend, or to cast disparaging light on another for your own gain. Truthfulness, unfortunately, is becoming rare in our society. Yet God demands honest speech from his people. Such speech is to be embodied in every part of our lives, public and private. The commandment, the ninth commandment we're speaking of, specifically forbids false testimony against your neighbor, a designated a designation, I'm sorry, often interpreted as applying only to fellow Israelites. Some sought legal loopholes to avoid applying this commandment in their interactions with non-Israelites. For society to function as it should, its people must be honest and forthright, not deceptive and withholding. To be the people of God is to be conformed to the heart of God. In light of this passage, what might it look for us to align ourselves with the heart of God? In Matthew 5, 33 through 37, we are reminded that the people of God should be so marked by truthfulness of speech and consistency of life that there is no room for doubt or need for oaths. So God's word must be our foundation of truth. God still desires that his people reflect the divine character of truth and justice. We are to pursue peace peace with God, and peace with one another. It's true for commandment number nine and with commandment number 10, which deals with covetousness or an unhealthy God-dishonoring preoccupation with materialism or what someone else has. It's not the material stuff that's the problem. The problem is when the pursuit of those things replaces our love and worship of a holy God who provides everything for us. So let's go a little bit deeper now with commandment 10. Contentment is the antidote to covetousness. Okay, so let's take a look again at some scriptures. And again, I'll be reading from the NIV in some cases, the message in others, or both. So let's start with 1 Timothy 6. 6 through 10, and I will read from the message. A devout life does bring wealth, but it's the rich simplicity of being yourself before God. Since we entered the world penniless and will leave it penniless, if we have bread on the table and shoes on our feet, that is enough. But if it's only money these leaders are after, They'll self-destruct in no time. Lust for money brings trouble and nothing but trouble. Going down that path, some lose their footing in the faith completely and live to regret it bitterly after. In 1 John 2, 15 and 17, again, I'll read from the message. It says, don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love of the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. And in these challenging times, that is the last thing that we need. We need to be as close as God, to worship him, and to give thanks in all things. Okay, to finish this scripture here, verse 17, the world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. As I reflected on these lesson scriptures concerning the 10th commandment and covetousness, these came to mind on how to cultivate contentment in our hearts. One of my favorites, Philippians 4.19, and I'll read from the New International Version and the message. First, the NIV. And my God will meet all, not some, all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And in the message it reads, 
you can be sure that God will take care of everything you need. His generosity exceeding even yours in the glory that pours from Jesus. Our God and Father abounds in glory that just pours out into eternity. Yes. And in Psalm 37, 25, it reads, um, the NIV version says, I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. And again, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, Matthew 6, 25 through 34, I'll read it quickly. And we should know these, but sometimes it's good to hear it again, to reinforce that God is still on the throne. He's still in control. And everything going on around us is just but for a temporary moment. In the NIV, it says, under do not worry, verse 25, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? That's all of us. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore... Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And even in the Lord's Prayer, we know that, you know, we say, give us this day our daily bread. Why? Because it's an acknowledgement to God, our Heavenly Father, that first of all, He has already provided for it. He's already got our needs well in hand, and it's up to us to ask, to look to him to be the supplier. So when, said, when God says in his Ten Commandments, do not covet, what he's saying is, really, why should you covet? You have your portion, your neighbor has their portion. It will come, it will go. We have everything that we need through prayer and keeping our eyes fixed firmly on God himself. And so, when I think about these two last commandments, I think about the beatitude that says, blessed are the peacemakers. Um, in Matthew 5 and 9, the NIV, it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. In the message, it says, you're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of competing or fighting. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. And so by speaking the truth, we maintain peace. By not coveting what belongs to someone else, we pursue after peace. In other words, peace with one another and peace with God himself. Now, back to the 10th commandment a little bit. Let's go a little bit deeper. The 10th commandment, forbids intense desire for anything that rightfully belongs to someone else. The command lists seven things not to be coveted, probably intending to cover everything of another that we might crave. The God-given desires for food, water, and clothing, for example, are not sinful. Covetousness is not simple desire, but illicit an insatiable desire. Remember a few weeks ago, we talked about David and Bathsheba. He glanced on her, he had an impure thought, and then he let it fester inside of him and kept dwelling on it, and it led to action that led to sin after sin after sin. 
wanting, um, so again, what I'm saying here is it's really wanting the wrong things far too much. You will have thoughts, but we've talked about, we've talked before about bringing our thoughts into captivity. But how much is too much? Does the expression, I want your life, indicate a problem with envy or covetousness? Which is worse? Like the first commandment, the tenth addresses inward attitudes and emotional states and not necessarily overt actions. Covetousness is forbidden because it encourages us to violate other commandments, stealing others' possessions, committing adultery, lying about it, and murdering up to cover up our crimes. So what are we talking about with if you're not coveted, if you're not coveting or wanting what someone else has, then you're pursuing after contentment, the antidote, if you will. So what is this thing called contentment? It's the satisfaction that comes from realizing we have enough food and clothing to be content. Contentment falls somewhere between subsistence and affluence, not too little, not too much. It is to have enough not to be dependent on the generosity of others. We are content when we're satisfied to have our basic needs met. The deeper problem Paul confronted was covetousness. Those with myths placed desires for wealth. They fall into temptation and a trap of diabolical design, and the trap consists in the many foolish and harmful desires which drive those who love money and other things to pursue even more. Covetousness, the insatiable craving for more, the inordinate passion for wealth can plunge people into ruin and destruction. Paul knew former Christians who had caused, who had chased after financial gain. Their all-consuming desire to get rich and love for more money and all it could buy caused them to wander from the faith and to pierce themselves with many griefs. So, to kind of begin to bring this all home a little bit, God entrusts us with more than enough so we can enjoy the blessing of feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, but we must avoid the desire for people to notice our huge pile of toys and instead develop a thankfulness for how God has blessed us. So along with contentment becomes a humble spirit. So today we're seeing that the followers of Jesus are called to reject covetousness and pursue contentment. The command against covetousness is an appropriate conclusion to the Ten Commandments as the violation of this commandment inevitably leads to the violation of many, if not all, of the others. This command is not a condemnation of desire in and of itself. It is rather the condemnation of inordinate desire and excessive desire for that which you don't possess. In 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10, Paul presents the alternative to covetousness, which we've been talking about, which is contentment. He reminds readers that the possessions they have so eagerly sought will not pass from this life to the next, the life of the age of the kingdom of God. So, often, contentment is the faithful response to desire choosing gratitude for what you have instead of allowing yourself to be consumed by that which you don't have. Contentment is not an innate skill, but a discipline requiring practice, and it takes effort and discipline. And I'm reminded again of another scripture, which is found in Philippians 4, 11, 12, and I'll read again from the message. Actually, I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much, with much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or empty. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. So the question to think about today is, how might you practice contentment well or better? 
if we all make a great effort to pursue peace, peace with God, peace with others, we have a greater opportunity to keep our fi eyes fixed on Christ, pursuing the kingdom and living in a right relationship with those around us. And so we'll wrap this up with another favorite scripture of mine, again to repeat, Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you're encouraged. Stay tuned with our live stream to find strength during our worship service to follow. If you have any questions or need special prayer, please contact Hernando Church of the Nazarene through our website, www.hernaz.org. Be blessed in Jesus' name.